Good evening and welcome to the virtual unveiling of the robe of Chief Justice John Marshall. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, Preservation Virginia CEO. I hope each of you and your families are well and enjoying this glorious spring evening. And thank you for taking some time and joining us tonight. This webinar is part of a series of educational programming organized by Preservation Virginia. I encourage you to visit our website to explore more webinars about John Marshall and his home, as well as our other historic sites and programs. Tonight, as we welcome the robes return to the Marshall House, we wanna take a moment with our special guests, Chief Judge Gregory, Kevin Walsh, and Jennifer Hurst Winder to explore a bit of the history and influence of John Marshall. Some housekeeping first, to keep to our timetable, we'll hold questions to the end. You may though type your question at any time during this program into the Q&A box and we're keeping track. Our panelists will respond to as many questions as time allows. We'll also employ the chat box to share links with more information about our partners in this conservation effort and how you can safely visit the John Marshall House to see the Rove in person. The session is being recorded and will be available in the next few days. Since 1911, Preservation Virginia has maintained and, and interpreted the John Marshall House to share the great Chief Justice's life and legacy. We're grateful to the many descendants who have returned furnishings, paintings, books, tableware, and personal items. The objects animate the rooms with silent echoes of the once bustling activities of the family, the members of the enslaved household, and the many guests who visited the Marshall's home. There is no more special artifact than the robe that John Marshall wore during his 34 year tenure as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. The robe was cared for by generations of descendants before finding its way into our collection. In the early years of stewarding the house, the robe was displayed in a museum room located on the home's second floor. Visitors recalled its presence as they ascended the stairs as it, and as it almost greeted them to enter the exhibit that included Mary Marshall's wedding dress, family memorabilia, and other items from our statewide collection, including earrings reportedly belonging to Pocahontas, and the queen of the Pamunkey frontlet. If robes could talk, what a story this one could share and the questions that could be answered from its construction and tailoring to tales of those journeys riding circuit, from the days worn he hearing arguments before the court to the loving care received over the years of curation by family members and Preservation Virginia staff. These fragile yards of silk evoke the story of the early years of the court and reps represent the tensile strength of the experiment in American democracy. The success of this project is credit to many of you who are watching and joining us tonight. Your contributions to the Save the Robe campaign have helped ensure that the robe has been stabilized and environmental factors are controlled to slow future deterioration. A big thank you to you all. Now our work moves to the next phase of providing ongoing educational programming at the house and through the initiatives of our partners at the John Marshall Center of Constitutional History and Civics. And we welcome you to learn more about those efforts. We're indebted to our partners at the John Marshall Center with whom we launched the Save the Robe campaign Ours is a decades long partnership in raising awareness of the life and legacy of the great Chief Justice. In particular, I wanna recognize Kevin Walsh and Joni Albrock and, and the board and staff of the center. In his lifetime, John Marshall supported Virginia's emerging cultural institutions. He was the first president of the Virginia Historical Society. Now, almost two centuries later, that connection remains strong with the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. 
We are grateful to Jamie Boskett and the VMHC for their contributions towards the conservation project and for including the robe in a special exhibit at the VMHC planned to open in, a, in spring of 2022. Preservation Virginia's team, specifically Jennifer Hurst Winder, Leah Lane, Eric Litchford, Mika Downey, and Will Glasgow, guided the effort to coordinate the conservation and prepare the exhibit space and install the exhibit. So here's a time if we were all together and in person, there'd be a round of applause to thank them all. So hopefully they can hear those virtual claps. And now it's my honor to introduce Jennifer Hurst Winder, Preservation Virginia's Director of Museum Operations. Jen has been with us for 12 years and under her leadership and care, our historic sites, the John Marshall House, Patrick Henry Scotchtown, Bacon's Castle, Smith's Fort, and Cape Henry Lighthouse have become centers of learning in their regions. Since March of 2020, Jen and her team have pivoted our traditional in-person programming to digital experiences that are reaching people across Virginia and the nation. And simultaneously, they were reopening our sites safely for guests. So Jen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I cannot even begin to tell you what an honor it is to be here tonight. The entire 12 years that I have been with Preservation Virginia, I have been waiting for this moment. Um, so I am so glad to be here to share with you this newly, newly conserved Supreme Court robe of Chief Justice Marshall. He served from 1801 to 1835. And this black silk textile is one of the only known examples of early Supreme Court robes in existence. So around here, we've started calling it a witness object. Um, and we call it that because John Marshall wore this robe as he presided over the Supreme Court for those 34 years and set precedents in many cases during which time the Supreme Court was elevated to a co-equal branch of the federal government. And today, this simple black robe is a recognizable icon of the American judicial system. Now, if you hold on just a moment, I'm gonna share my screen so we can look at some pictures. All right. So in this image, um, which is uh, of Justice John Marshall, and it was done by, by Chester Harding, you can actually see him donning the robe. Um, and, and like I mentioned, this is, this is truly uh, the icon of the American judicial system. Now it carries so much meaning uh, because, of the, uh, because of the person who wore the object and the moments that it was worn. And so I'm sure that the vast majority of you know that um, it was during Marshall's time on the Supreme Court that, uh, that his most significant precedent was set, judicial review. Um, and it was in cases like this that he uh, asserted the court's power and authority to interpret the US Constitution. But the robe also had some more mundane activities. Um, it hung on a peg in the old Supreme Court chambers inside the US Capitol, along with the robes of the other justices. Um, it's, it's, so, so it's been a longstanding tradition for this robe to be part of the collection at the John Marshall House. Um, after Chief Justice's death in 1835, it seems that the robe actually stayed within the Marshall family. And it was thanks to the generosity of uh, descendant John Marshall's granddaughter, Emily Harvey, um, that the robe has been part of our collection um, since the house first opened in 1911. You know, over the next century, the iconic robe was on frequent display and decades of that public appreciation were hard on this already fragile silk. And so the garment's conservation needs were very apparent and the robe was taken off display in the early 2000s. So in 2018, Preservation Virginia sought the expertise of textile conservation expert, Howard Sutcliffe, 
the principal at River Region, River Region Costume and Textile Conservation to conserve the road. Mr. Sutcliffe has worked on a vast range of priceless objects, including fragments of medieval, medieval Egypt, the Tsar Nicholas II's parade uniform, and Kermit the Frog, uh, which is now the Smithsonian. And now his long list of achievements includes John Marshall's robe. So in this image, you can see Howard and our curator of collections, Leah Lane, who will be joining us at the end of this program, um, moving the robe in its box uh, to his studio. So bringing Howard on to conserve the robe wouldn't have been possible without the Save the Robe campaign. And it was in 2019 that Preservation Virginia, together with the John Marshall Center for Constitutional Civics and History, launched the Save the Robe campaign. And our, so with the first phase of funding in hand, we were able to conserve the robe and move forward. Now Howard spent over 300 plus man hours to stabilize the silk and reverse some of the earlier repairs to, to the robe. And he collaborated with us to develop an exhibit case that would house it. Now it's thanks to our generous donors and the team of professionals that undertook the conservation effort uh, so that future generations are going to have the opportunity to view John Marshall's robe and stand in the presence of history. Now the robe has returned to the house and it's returned with a new exhibit intended to endure the conservation and legacy of John Marshall's Supreme Court robe. And so we hope that you will connect with us um, via Instagram or on our Facebook page or through our website or through our e-news, which I do believe those links are going to be dropped into the chat. Um, and you're going to be able to learn about the upcoming digital and live events that we have planned for the year that the robe is with us. Uh, so we hope that you will join us in person after this to, to see the famous black robe yourself. Um, and so with that, I would like to introduce um, Professor Kevin Walsh, um, who teaches and writes in the area of federal jurisdiction and constitutional law at U of R. He's also the president of the John Marshall Center for Constitutional History and Civics. And as a side note, there is no better scholar that I know of um, to talk about John Marshall and his history. And in the many years that I've been part of Preservation Virginia, it's been an absolute honor to work with uh, Professor Walsh and, uh, had ha and listen to all, all, of, uh, all of his exaltations of John Marshall. So I will turn it over to you, Professor Walsh. As soon as I stop sharing this presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer uh, and Elizabeth, and it and and it's a, a real treat. I mean, just so special to be here with all of you uh, this evening uh, virtually. I can't wait to see this robe. Uh, you know, last time I saw it, it was it was in that box, and uh, it looked like it needed a little bit of help and, and um, some TLC, and it's gotten way more than that. Uh, this. Uh, this uh, I've been looking forward to this, knowing that it existed, uh, and then waiting to see uh, because I've read about um, people um, seeing this robe and being touched by it, and 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 I I really believe that when people can see this uh, and not just see the robe but also replicas, right, to understand uh, the humanity uh, of uh, of this enterprise. So uh, so thank you to Preservation Virginia. Uh, particularly, and also to uh, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture uh, that uh, has been so essential uh, to this as well. Um, now, it's it's almost finals period uh, at the law school, so so things are uh, a little tense. Uh, and I I, I I won't give a test, um, but quiz yourself, okay? Um, where would you look? Why do we even have a constitution? Well, the Constitution tells us why we have a Constitution. So maybe check the, the so what does it say? Well, there's a, um, a preamble and the preamble tells us um, why we have it. And, uh, and you may know this preamble from the Schoolhouse Rock song and I won't sing the whole thing, um, but it helps to remember the very first thing uh, that is in the preamble um, is we the people, we the people of the United States and this is, uh, this is in some ways revolutionary. This is one people uh, as compared with a, uh, a bunch of 
United States, the Declaration of Independence of these United States. Uh, so if you compare the wording of the Independ Declaration of Independence, they talk about one people. That's very good. Um, but these United States, United is actually lowercase. It's clearly a an adjective modifying states, whereas in the Constitution it says, we the people of the United States looks like a, a proper a proper noun. Now what but so we have this constitution, right? Why? In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, right? So we won't do the whole thing. But look at those first two things. And the first one is key. In order to form a more perfect union, uh, you don't so uh, sometimes you might think, how can something be more perfect? I thought perfect is perfect. Well, uh, this means sort of made through and through from the Latin. Uh, so so per perfect made a, a more through and through a union and then to establish justice. So we had one people, one constitution, one nation, uh, but three branches, three branches. And so uh, this artifact that we're unveiling tonight virtually and then we get to see in person for everyone um, who is able uh, this is the preeminent symbol of the third branch of the united states government uh, and so just as uh, just as uh, saint patrick would teach the irish uh, and and others about the trinity using the shamrock that's why i'm wearing my shamrock tie i think we can teach about the three branches of government using this the robe, um, because the black, simple black robe means so much. And I'm delighted that Chief Judge Gregory is with us to, to speak about uh, one of the very important um, symbols uh, or meanings of this symbol, namely the neutrality of justice. Um, so I do think of Marshall as the number three, uh, and this can be sometimes a little bit misleading um, because, as, as you all know, he wasn't the first Chief Justice. And he wasn't the third either, although he may have been the third to wear a robe as Chief Justice because John Rutledge uh, never got uh, his his um, uh, confirmation. Never, it just never came through. Um, so Marshall's the fourth. So why do I think of him as number three? In part because his branch is Article Three, uh, and also if on this theme of uh, the union of one people under one government, I, I think he is the third most important figure in American history for this idea of national union. Uh, Washington, George Washington, uh, in the words that Marshall did not write, but that he delivered on the floor of Congress, right? First in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Uh, and then we had a second founding of sorts uh, and, and a reconstruction. Uh, and uh, that was because of Abraham Lincoln uh, and, and his sort of dedication at the cemetery in Gettysburg um, talked about um, one people. But what carried us through, it wasn't just one person, it just wasn't, wasn't just one branch, so I don't want to give uh, overclaim for John Marshall. Uh, but uh, he helped us in his writings in the Constitution understand us as one nation. And so I, I thought I'd just share a, a three-part thing on, on, on that. So in McCulloch versus Maryland, it's most, probably the most uh, well-known case, the one where uh, he said, this is a constitution intended to endure for ages to come, to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. Okay, I'm going to read you a little piece of McCulloch versus Maryland. Uh, and, and I want you to, to, does that remind you of anything um, that Lincoln said? So Marshall says, the government of the union is emphatically and truly a government of the people in form and substance. It emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be direct exercised directly on them and for their benefit. Okay, this gets picked up by Daniel Webster in the great uh, debates in the U.S. Senate, and of course, right? Lincoln had a better way with words. Marshall, he he wrote uh, very important opinions, but wasn't always uh, as as succinct as uh, Abraham Lincoln when and, and, and his concluding words. Right, the, we all know them that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. And this robe is a reminder that this government is a government of people. Uh, at, at, at the Harvard Law School, it, it, it has a quotation on the library from Bracton, non sub homine sub deo et lege, not under man, but under God and the law. Well, the law is administered by human beings. Uh, and at the same time, it can't vary from person to person. People, when they go into a court, they should feel 
as if they are getting impartial justice. Okay, that 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 it's no matter which team member they get of the judiciary. Okay, that they're getting a fair shake, and the fact that they wear this simple black robe uh, in throughout the federal system really um, speaks exactly to that, to the impartiality. It's this mix of the personally administering, but the impersonality of the office. Think about when people become judges, the investiture ceremony, the robing. It's a, it's a, it's a transformative, important experience. So what comes next in this campaign? So thank you for, for sharing this uh, with the world. What comes next for us? Well, um, I mentioned the replicas. Uh, I've heard people have fun, have had fun trying on some of the rec replicas, and we'd like to bring replicas out there. We want people to be able, um, students especially, to see themselves, to imagine themselves uh, as a judge, uh, to to see, uh, to to talk to judges and ask them, what does the robe mean to you? Uh, what is the importance of this? So, with your help, now that phase one is done, we want to continue to tell the story of the robe, of our union and of this one people, and your help has been essential to that, and I am so grateful. Thank you. And when and, and so I want you to hear when Judge, Chief Judge Gregory, uh, when I was a, a law clerk um, for um, uh, Paul, uh, Judge Paul Niemeyer on the Fourth Circuit, uh, I, I saw Chief Judge Gregory in his robes uh, and, and, and watched uh, them administer justice, and I can't think of a better person um, to to speak to us this evening uh, about uh, the significance of the robe. And this is this is just the beginning. So thank you all, um, Professor Walsh. Once again, uh, thank you so much. That that was an excellent history lesson. Uh, and so now I would like to introduce um, the Honorable Roger L. Gregory, Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Fourth Circuit. Uh, Chief Judge Gregory received a Bachelor's of Arts from Virginia State University and his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Michigan. He was first appointed to the Fourth, Fourth Circuit in 2000 and has served as Chief Judge since 2016. And it is an honor to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much. And first, I just want to just uh, give a shout out and congratulations to the collaboration, the wonderful institutions to bring this tangible witness to the public view and be able to see and understand a little bit more about this great Chief Justice. You know, Kevin sets a high bar. I mean, I didn't realize he was going to sing. I, you know, it was, it was just to the top. And then he says that, you know, he's a professor these years, but he was a, a young clerk and I was on the court. So he's, he's dated how old I am too. But this is, this is just an honor uh, to talk about the neutrality of justice. Chief Justice Marshall, he well understood that he had to do two things. And that is give power to the constitution and give prestige to the court. And the prestige is not one of egoism, but the prestige that if we're gonna be an enduring nation with a solid third branch of government, we have to have it uh, a court that people could look up to with the integrity and understanding that it was the rule of law that prevailed. So neutrality of justice is that whole idea. I think the robe represents the black away from the colorful ermine, the furs, and the, and the scarlet lapels that were very common in, in, in England. And from this idea of a black robe, and from a science standpoint, the spectrum of colors, black is all of the colors. All of the colors in the spectrum come together to create black. And I think that's a lot of symbolism made in sense. This court must represent all of our aspirations about government in that sense. So neutrality does not mean indifference. Oh, far from it. Informed by the public need, as, as Kevin talked about, to establish justice and it talked about the prosperity for those that go on and on and on. So, so what he was saying is that the prestige of the court came from the adherence to do justice, first of all. That's the first mandate of the preamble. And, and that, that singular ideal of neutrality is not about that so the honor comes from fulfilling that duty. That's how the prestige was accomplished. And that was the greatest, the most 
the, I guess the, I would say the signature of Chief Judge John Marshall's uh, contribution is that the whole idea that judicial philosophy and the culture of the court became the neutrality of justice. That, that was the leading brilliance because the idea was not just the individuals, not just their will, not their pomp and circumstance, but toiling at this idea of what does the constitution mean and how can it figure in establishing justice. And what are the elements of that? Neutrality of justice talks about a promise, a promise to, as I said, to adhere to justice and that you honor lives in fulfilling that duty. And most importantly, you must suspend your personal biases when interpreting the law and in applying those facts to the understanding of the law. That's how we preserve the rule of law. You, you recognize we all have biases, but they must be suspended when we interpret a statute, and interpret constitutional provisions, and then apply the facts to that honest interpretation. And therefore be neutral because you don't favor either side. You don't advocate for a side, you only advocate for truth and justice. And you decide cases according to the law that protects the rule of law. And secondly, promote the confidence and integrity of the court and impartiality. That's where the prestige comes from when people can look up and say, these are honest men and women. And we know later, now we have women on the court, then it was all men, but there was room at the table and the idea, the concept that will be filled by people of diverse gender and color and ethnicity. So it gave us the idea when we move toward justice and neutrality, we can do that. And next, stay away from entanglements of politics and financial interests and influences by social concerns. Conduct yourself always with sound judgment and conduct, avoiding anything that might be an entanglement that would put cast a pall on the court or seeming to have the appearance of impropriety or bias. These are the kind of things that are hallmarks of neutrality of justice. I think Justice Frankfurter on the court, and he was born in Austria. Uh, there were four Supreme Court justices not born in the United States, the others early on, but he was born in Austria. One of my favorite things he said was this. He said that an opinion ought not to be the expression of mere will, it ought to be the effort of reason to discover justice. That's the essence of the neutrality of justice. Not just your will, not what you want, but to fulfill the duty of the constitution and all those principles so that our Supreme Court could be a living institution and still represent those symbols of equal justice under the law. And Chief Justice Marshall, his brilliance, his jurisprudence and the neutrality and many people on the court living up to that principle is what we honor today. And the robe is so symbolic of that neutrality and that oneness and uniformity. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about the great Chief Justice. Thank you so much, Judge Gregory. It's an honor to have you here and, and to hear your words about the importance of this, uh, of this object of John Marshall's uh, Supreme Court robe. So thank you so much. Well, we obviously recognized the importance of this robe. And so we uh, were lucky enough to bring on um, Howard Sutcliffe to conserve it. And, uh, and, and so when he brought it back, we went ahead and uh, conducted an interview um, with him. And so he's going to speak to us a little bit about the technical processes that he went through um, to conserve the robe. Uh, and so uh, since he is, is not here with us, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen once again and play this five minute video um, by Mr. Sutcliffe. Uh, hello, my name is Howard Sutcliffe. I'm a textile conservator and I run River Region Costume and Textile Conservation based just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. I first came to look at the robe back in January of 2019 and um, the robe was in really poor condition. Um, so when I first saw it, taking it out of the box, it was a very 
gingerly process because uh, the silk was um, actively shattering so there were splits and breaks throughout the entire body of the robe and the sleeves. It's a costume so it's been in contact with um, you know a body for quite a long period of time. Um, sweat um, marks and there's deterioration because of the sweat. There's also evidence of, you know, kind of like hair products and um, just general wear and tear. Um, you know, you can see that the cuffs are very degraded from where, you know, he had been writing for long periods. Um, you know, the hemline is very damaged because, you know, it would have been in contact with the ground. And so you have kind of like that mechanical damage that is also, you know, um, evidence of use, basically. The robe obviously is, is very old. Um, it's also made of silk, which of the natural fibers um, is probably the one that is most susceptible to environmental damage from things like UV light and fluctuations in uh, relative humidity and temperature. On top of that, it is also dyed black. And so the chemicals that would have been used to achieve that depth of shade, that dark color, would also have been quite deleterious to the silk fibers as well. There was also a lot of work that has been done to the robe over the years. There's at least five different campaigns of conservation or restoration that have happened. And so those interventions also add another added layer to uh, the complication of conservation. This was a very big conservation challenge. Um, and also a great opportunity to work on um, such an iconic piece of American history. Um, I've been lucky enough to work on a, a couple of um, pieces like that throughout my career, kind of like Andrew Jackson's inaugural top hat um, and Osceola's belt. So after surface cleaning, the robe was humidified um, to gently introduce moisture back into the silk fibers. Um, to help them to relax and then I really went through the robe looking at uh, all of the past interventions and um, determining whether those old repairs were still doing the job they were supposed to do whether they were actually providing enough support or whether they were even kind of like causing further damage and so once that had been established um, I removed the old repairs that um, were causing damage or weren't really providing enough support. Um, and then I basically resupported the entire robe. And so that means that um, it was lined using um, a fine black silk organza material. And the organza was cut into panels, basted to the interior of the robe. And then the exterior of the robe was gridded out and I then ran very long lines of laid thread couching through the entire body of the robe to kind of hold it all together. It's a big object, so you know, there's just a lot of stitching that needed to be done. Um, it's always good to you know, finish an object, finish a project, but I don't always get to um, you know, travel back to uh, the home institution with them. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of see it from really from beginning to end and see it finally um, installed. And as a conservator, um, it's always good to um, be involved in that final installation and kind of, you know, make sure that it looks as good as it possibly can. So the conservation that's been carried out um, hopefully will um, prevent any future damage from happening. Um, it has stabilized um, the damage that is there. Um, the aim with conservation is always to um, really try and be as reversible as possible within limits. Um, the aim is also that people don't notice what we've actually done. And so um, hopefully uh, the conservation has achieved that. And did you try it on? I did. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>
so, so the next uh, the the next phase of today's presentation is what we've all been waiting for. Um, it is going to be our unveiling. Um, now, I should tell you all that this is our first live unveiling on a digital platform, um, and so bear with us. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to turn my screen off and we're actually going to dim the lights. So there's no technical difficulties. Um, it's just it's just us preparing. So uh, bear with us for just a moment. Okay, all set. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you the newly conserved robe of Chief Justice John Marshall. Okay, everybody. <laughs> we are so excited. Um, and so uh, at this point, we're actually going to go on to a the Q and A portion of um, of our presentation. And so, let's see, we have. So this is Leah Lane. She's our curator of collections here at Preservation Virginia, and uh, the two of us, as well as our honored guests. Um, are going to be here to answer some of the questions from the Q&A. And I, I believe I'll hand it over to Will, and he's going to go ahead and ask us some of these questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome from the, the John Marshall House. Uh, so I'm Will Glasgow, the Director of Development for Preservation Virginia. And uh, we're all masked up here since we're all in the house together. But a few questions to, to throw y'all's way. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an easy one to start with. We have one question. Um, what was John Marshall's height and weight? Because he looks, that's a really big robe. <laughs> well, we, we don't know how much he weighed, um, but we do know that he was about six foot one. Um, and uh, Howard is actually about six foot one. And we had a couple of replica robes made and um, Howard did in fact try on the replica um, and it pulls at his feet. And so now we are questioning um, how John Marshall would have worn the robe, uh, which it's, it's actually a really great question because as you can see the, uh, the portrait of John Marshall, if you look at the way that he's holding the robe, he actually has it tossed over both of his forearms and that way it doesn't drag on the ground, I suppose. Sure. Yeah, it, it was impressive when we brought the, the case inside earlier this week, uh, it really put into perspective how big this robe really was <laughs> when, we, when we set the case up. So it's, it's rather large. Uh, another question was, um, how long is this, this conservation going to uh, preserve the robe? Do we know how much time this is buying us to enjoy it? Yeah, so I actually talked to Howard about this um, earlier today. Um, and he didn't give us, you know, an actual age or an, um, you know, number of years, but he did say that as it is, it is stabilized. It is in a good environment. And as long as we don't move it a ton, it's going to be okay. So I think we've got several more generations to share this with. Um, and that is thanks to the help of all of our supporters um, and, um, and Howard's excellent work. And, uh, and, and one question, perhaps this is a good one for Professor Walsh. Um, what, what did Thomas Jefferson think of John Marshall's robe? Was he a fan? <laughs> they didn't often get along. 
Well, you know, they're they're studying the history of because uh, if you look at Chief Justice John Jay, you'll see he's wearing a different kind of robe, and uh, they're studying the history of how the court came to um, wear all black. Um, but one of the um, one of the things is that Virginia's judges wore simple black robes, uh, and and some have speculated that Marshall promoted the black robe um, for reasons very similar to um, what Judge Gregory was talking about. That is almost like people talked about the Republican simplicity of the robe as compared with, um, as uh, some of our friends would say, the Santa Claus robes uh, that other other folks would uh, other would have. So I, I think that uh, Jefferson approved. I think that this was a a, a a uniform that was well known, uh, and uh, hey, it's not wigs. Uh, I don't think Jefferson would have approved of that. And Marshall was not a man of fashion by any means, um, so I think he would have been very pleased to stick with something uh, conservative like this. <laughs> and I think this is a good question for uh, uh, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Elizabeth, how long has Preservation Virginia had the robe, and um, since? But before being CEO, you were once the curator here. Um, how was it displayed previously and where? Thank you, Will. Um, really, as Jen said in her opening remarks, the, the house and the robe sort of came together. It was uh, Ellen Harvey, I believe, was the uh, donor of the robe. She was one of the great granddaughters, um, if my memory serves me. So it's been in the... the um, collection for a long time. I think previously it's been on a mannequin. It was on a mannequin when it was uh, displayed in the Marshall House in the museum room, which was APVA's museum room at the beginning in, in 1911, 1912. And then when I first came as curator, the, the robe had just been conserved and was brought back. And the recommendation was to create a padded mannequin that would relieve some of the pressure on the fabric. Um, we now know that that added to the stress and strain of that very delicate silk. So this idea of having it lie flat and in a case um, that provides it with, a, uh, with humidity control and light control um, will help give the uh, robe a longer life. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, we, we found that sometimes in the past uh, decades ago that when they thought they were doing the right thing with the collections piece, it turned out they, they might have been doing more harm than good, right? So, uh, but we do believe that, that this conservation will last a long, long time. And uh, Chief Judge Gregory, we have a question here about, um, are, are there any of Marshall's rulings that, that still affect some of your decisions and still have impact on on things that, that uh, on court cases that still happen today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, Kevin uh, talked about is McCullough. And that is, he probably was the biggest expansion of federal government because congressional power, and the whole idea was that it didn't have to be what's just expressed in terms of that, but those things that implied powers, those are necessary to, to implement those. And we're always looking at that. What did Congress mean? What, what was the intent? What is the constitutional provision? So that whole guideline of jurisprudence is there because we look at it in terms of what is the intent to effectuate what Congress meant and what the framers wanted government to do. Limited, but enough to effectuate. So that, that framework still exists in, in our jurisprudence. This might be a question for you, Judge Gregory and Professor Walsh. Uh, did they stop wearing wigs before or after the revolution? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let Kevin get the hard part, but I will tell you, Jefferson clearly did not like wigs. Matter of fact, he told me that it looked like they were mice peering through like, to, to, to the oatmeal, oat moth. <laughs> so, but I, I think it was a way to get away from the English symbol and, 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 and reality. And, and and I think it varied too from state to state. Uh, there was pra the practice varied from state to state. And uh, one of the stories when we've been studying kind of the history of this black robe, uh, one of the stories uh, has it that uh, Justice Cushing, one of the uh, j uh, justices on on the court, an associate justice, um, he was coming from Massachusetts, and uh, it, the story has it that uh, he brought his wig, uh, and no one else did. 
uh, and he wore it once and exactly once, and that's it. Um, so uh, it seems, at least for the judges, they went the way um, uh, 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 they, they went away uh, earlier on. As for the lawyers, I'm not sure. Uh, there, uh, the, the, the uh, I. I don't think John Marshall wore a wig. I've certainly never seen any description of him wearing a wig arguing. Uh, there are descriptions of him arguing and the way he the, the, the held his hands and did different things. It was that this was his big move right there. Um, but uh, I'm not I, I haven't seen anything on the on, on the wigs. I think they were I think they were gone. And look, uh, one of the things about the robe that's really amazing when you look at it. Right. Uh, Howard Sutcliffe mentioned the sweat. Well, those of us in Virginia uh, in the summers uh, and, and other places would know that, um, why would you put one of those things on your head? Uh, I mean, t talk about talk about un uncomfortable. So I, I just can't imagine that, that he would do it uh, way too, way too sure. stuffy. Well, well, thank you both. And, and two, more, two more questions before we, we wrap up here. We're, we're losing the light in the Marshall House, right? It's, uh, but, um, this is a little bit more of an opinion piece, so I think everyone can weigh in. It is often said that John Marshall is the most important American never elected president. Is, is this true? Kind of a tough one. I'm putting it out to the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> I, think he was, I think he was a bit too humble a man to, to, to run for president. Is that a way to put it? Or <laughs> you know, I, I would say this. I don't know. That, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm sure. It could a lot of answers, but I would say this, you know, there's Washington, they fought for uh, freedom in this, from England and Thomas Jefferson fought for the freedom. But I like to be said because Marshall both fought and fought for it. So you could say that may be a fair statement to make about history and his accomplishment. And, and just one last quick question about the robe itself before we, we close out. Uh, this one's for, for Jen and Leah in the exhibit. What are the actual measurements of the robe? How, how big is this thing? So the robe is pretty much completely splayed out here. And it's about uh, six foot by seven foot in the case. Um, so it's a little bit in from that, but it is, it's a lot of fabric. Um, and uh, yeah, very, very long. Well, we certainly encourage folks to come to come see it. Uh, the Marshall House is open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, or by appointment. Uh, we'd love for y'all to come by and, and see the robe in person. But um, with that, uh, Elizabeth and Jen, would y'all like to, to close us out here? Well, I'll, I'll just say thank you to everybody that has participated tonight. This is a very special evening. Um, and thank you to all the donors that helped to make this possible. Um, this is a very important object, and it is, as Jen and um, Judge Gregory have said, it's a witness to history. And that's all, I think we all know that history is among us these days, and it's important to honor these things and understand their context. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to the day when we can all be together. Take care, everybody. Everyone, good night. Bye. Come visit the room. Yeah. <laughs> Come visit. <laughs> good night. Great job. Congratulations. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah.